Hey there! I'm going to try to tell you everything that you need to know to be successful on Competency 1 of the Texas ESL Supplemental Exam. Competency 1 is that the ESL teacher understands fundamental language concepts and knows the structure and conventions of the English language. So why is that important? That's important because research has shown that effective second language instruction explicitly teaches the features of second language, which includes syntax, grammar, vocabulary, pronunciations, and conventions of social use. <clears throat> so you need to know what these things are. We're going to start with the linguistics part, and then in the second video, I'll show you the grammar part. So in the linguistics part, we're going to start with a phoneme. When you think of a phone, you're talking through sound, and phonics is the study of word and letter sounds in a language. A phoneme is simply the smallest unit of sound that can distinguish one word from another. For example, in the word bad, in bat, there's one phoneme of difference, the d versus the t. Sometimes we have phonemes that are made up of more than one letter, and these are called digraphs. <clears throat> For example, sh, ch, n, and f. And that sounds really funny doing that, but when I used to say sh, ch, th, I had a speech pathologist get a hold of me who reminded me that if I say sh, that's two phonemes because it's sh and a. Uh. So those are digraphs. It's one phoneme made up of two letters. Different from digraphs are consonant blends. A consonant blend is a group of two or three consonants that create each one a distinct sound, but they're blended together. For example, in the word blend, you have the bl, as in black and blue and block. The bl, the b, and the l, each makes their own distinctive sound, so it's a consonant blend, but they're blended together. Similarly, cl, r, tr, and sm, as in smug, small, or smile. So for a quick practice, uh, can you count the number of phonemes in the word chin? It's three, ch, it, n, or the word three, th, r, re. That's how many phonemes are in those words. Uh, one of the harder ones, let's look at enough. I, n, uf, I, n, n, f. There's four phonemes in the word enough. So one thing that we can do with ELLs or with any emerging uh, reader who's developing phonemic awareness is teach them minimal pairs. A minimal pair is minimally different because there's only one phoneme of difference between the words. So for example, the word rat and the word bat. It's r versus b, or in the word bus versus the word bun, it's only the final phoneme that's different. So books like Cat in the Hat are full of minimal pairs and teaching these to students helps them to develop a little bit more phonemic awareness. So how are phonemes actually created? Well. You can create sounds through three ways, place of articulation, manner of articulation, and voicing. So you don't have to memorize this entire diagram here. Place of articulation is simply the place where air is constricted in order to make sound. It's some place in your throat or your mouth or your nose where you're making sound come out. One of the examples is the alveolar ridge, and we'll be using this example on the next couple slides. The alveolar ridge is that ridge at the roof of your mouth where you can burn when you eat pizza. <clears throat> you can stick your tongue right there, and that's where you make the d -t -s -z -n sounds. So try that real quick. Say d -t -s -z -n. Yep, and you'll notice that your tongue stayed in the same place. You didn't have to really move your tongue around. Uh, another place of articulation is bilabial. That's where the b, p, m sound all come from. If I just mouth those sounds, you have no idea which one I was mouthing because they all look the same because they have the same place of articulation, the same place where we're making the sound. So after we have the place of articulation, the next step is manner of articulation. Not just where are you making the sound, but how are you making the sound. So when you're thinking about manner of articulation, you can have a plosive, like the t sound, or the p sound, and those are sounds that you can kind of put your hand in front of your mouth and go t p, and you feel the puff of air when you're beatboxing, t p, t p, t p, t p. 
Those are our plosives. Then you have your nasals, and those are the sounds that come through your nose, like the n and the m sound. And I taught seventh grade way too long not to love the word fricative. A fricative is when we just block the airstream. So if you make the d sound, d, you'll notice that the sound actually comes out when your tongue just kind of goes right there, and the sound goes in that little space that you make. Similar with s or z, you're sending the sound through a small, narrow airstream. And those are fricatives. So these five sounds um, have all the same place of articulation, same tongue placement, but three different manners of articulation to make the sound. But if we think about, for example, the s and the z sounds, there's one more thing that makes a difference, and that's voicing. So voiced consonants quite simply vibrate. So V is for vibration, V is also for voicing. So if you put your hand on your throat very gently and you go s, you can tell the difference between a voiced and an unvoiced consonant. And I say consonant because all vowels are voiced. So you can look at the chart if you want, and you could memorize the list of voiced and unvoiced consonants, or you could just know that one vibrates and the other one doesn't. So fat versus that, v, or thick versus this. Um, if it's a voiced consonant, it's going to have that vibration. So the way I've seen this presented on a practice test, for example, is that we will have students uh, there was an example of a student who was mispronouncing the word poem as boem, and he was voicing the P sound and causing it to come out as a B sound. So that's how you might see this presented on the Texas. Okay, moving on from phonemes, now we move into morphemes. And you probably know what a morpheme is, even if you don't know the word to attach to it. Morphemes are the most elemental units of meaning. So these can be prefixes, root words, suffixes. So if I take the word reader, I've got the morpheme read, and I've got the morpheme er, meaning one who does this thing. Or if I have the morpheme redevelopment, I have the morpheme, I have the word redevelopment, the morpheme re, the morpheme develop, and the morpheme mint. So I've got three morphemes in there picking up units of meaning. Here in KDISD, we use a word study program where students study morphology, which is the study of elemental units of meaning. And it's very helpful to teach this to English language learners because then they're able to take what they've learned about morphemes and apply them to new contexts as they come across new words. It's an important uh, word attack skill. So then we have semantics, and semantics is the study of linguistic meaning. This can include homophones, are there, there, and there. Uh, and homophones are involved in ambiguity when we have things like she cannot bear children or she cannot bear children. Uh, what that word bear actually means depends on the context. Similarly with a sentence like she's a German language teacher. Is she a teacher of the German language or is she a teacher who teaches language who also happens to be German? Another thing that goes into the study of semantics uh, or word meaning is cognates, false cognates. We love it when we come across a cognate like planet and planeta because we're able to figure out what words mean. Every now and then our false cognates throw us off. Like if we see the word asistir in Spanish and we think it means to help when really it means to attend. So semantics is figuring out what we mean. And when you hear someone say, don't argue semantics with me, what they mean is don't split hairs with me over the meaning of these words. Orthography just means conventional systems of spelling of a language. Uh, one of the issues with English orthography is that it has less to do with phonics and more to do with whatever was happening historically at that time. The fact that there was kind of a return to classicalism during the uh, advent of the printing press and people are wanting to go back and spell things the old classical way or whatever spelling was prevalent when the printing press came out seemed to kind of stick. Um, a lot of languages have very predictable phonetic orthographic patterns. English doesn't always. So we have to be careful when we're teaching spelling patterns to also keep in mind that not all spelling patterns are absolute in English. Our I before E except after C or when sounding like A is a neighbor and way and a thousand other exceptions to that rule. So we have to be careful with that orthography. 
Syntax Yoda reminds me of. Syntax is just word order. It's how we arrange words in a sentence. <clears throat> Every language has its own syntax, and as native speakers, we really just kind of internalize this. And syntax is a great place for that L1 interference or negative transfer to come into play. Um, syntax, the only part of language it is not, but important it is. We have a tendency to want to impose our syntax onto other languages. So if I was to translate into Spanish, now it's time to play. I would want to say, ahora es el tiempo para jugar. And I would pretty much be wrong, even though I technically got the words right. And I know this because my kid has a toy that sings, ya es hora de jugar. And I was like, well, that's not the syntax that I would have used if I had gone for through trying to do word for word translation because I haven't paid attention to the actual syntax of the target language. So sometimes we have to demonstrate for the students and a great way to do this is through recasting. So if a student walks up to you and says, oh, I like your shirt red, and you say, no, no, honey, you like my red shirt because in English we put the adjective in front of the noun, well, that kid doesn't like anything anymore, right? So what you can do is recast it back and say, oh, you like my red shirt? I love your blue shirt. And that helps them start to learn and pick up on the English syntax. Pragmatics. Pragmatics is a term that has to do with what is socially and contextually appropriate in language. So the cartoon here is a pragmatics cartoon. Tell the men to move out. Why, sir? The rent is too high. Well, the joke is that obviously that's not appropriate to this context. That's not the semantics of the pragmatics of this context. That's not what they mean. So it's all about what's situationally appropriate. Probably as a teacher, you have the same exact script of the first 20 seconds of every single parent phone call. You have that tone of voice that you have. Hi, this is so-and-so. I'm just calling this. You have your same script that you use every time and because it's situationally appropriate. And we have to help our students learn that too. Uh, what's situationally appropriate in addressing a teacher is different from addressing peers. Uh, a teacher in English might also say things like, would you please put your books away? It sounds like a request, but really it means put your books away. Um, in English, we tend to be very polite with our requests. And I've seen other speakers of languages that are much more direct get kind of confused here when we're giving a command that sounds like a question. Uh, we also have students who, in their culture, it might be part of the pragmatics for students to sit down and be quiet in the classroom. That's what a good kid does. They don't speak. Where in English, in American schools, we understand the link between oracy and literacy, so we want students to participate, and we have to communicate to our kids. Pragmatics can also include body language. What is appropriate eye contact? What is appropriate distance to stand between somebody? All of this is very determined by culture, and when we're working with new students, we have to help them learn the pragmatics. Part of that goes into the social register. And the academic register, so it's our informal, hey, what's up, how's it going kind of language versus our how do you do language. And well, according to my observations, I can conclude, goes into our academic register. And for ELLs, we really need to model both and help them understand when to use which one. As students get more into the advanced and advanced high level, we need to provide more scaffolding for the academic register. And then the last thing that we have in our linguistics section is figurative language. This is the stuff that English teachers just love. It's all of our hyperboles and metaphors and similes and uh, symbolism. And I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, which is a hyperbole. And then we have idioms, which sometimes we use without noticing. Earlier I said something about splitting hairs. That's an idiom. You're driving me up the wall is an idiom. Um, in hot water is an idiom. And what research tells us is that to help English language learners learn the meaning of idioms, we have them actually draw a picture of the literal meaning of the idiom along with examples of the idiom being used figuratively. Okay, so that clears us up for the linguistics vocabulary. I hope you found that helpful. Next, we'll talk about grammar.